Hey, weirdos, I'm Elena. I'm Ash. And this is Morbid. Whoa. You might hear some faint, you probably won't actually, but if you do, you hear, if you might hear some faint like, Rain tip tapping on the window. You guys like that. Ambiance. Ambiance. Yeah, you guys do like that. We've got a lot of people who are like, I love that sound. Some it was very calming. It, but I don't know how you don't like the sound of rain tip tapping. It's very calming. Um, I you might not even be able to hear it because we have soundproofing, but like you never know. I don't know. You know? I don't know your life. I don't, I don't know your ears. I don't, I don't know, know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. Okay. Who even are you? <laughs> so I'm just kidding. You're a weirdo. Love I love you. you. Uh so yeah, welcome back to Part two of the H.H. H. Holmes saga. Yay. So excited to be uh, here. We're going we're gonna to get into it today. So the first <clears throat> uh, part was kind of setting it up, where he came from, his first marriage, how he was a philanderer, how he was a schemer, how he was a shitty student, how he smelled of smegma. No, I didn't uh, want to say how it again. How he <laughs> was a liar and a cheater and a broader and just he's just an all-around shit person yeah well now we're gonna add murder to his repertoire oh what a um, what a repertoire yeah he's awful and he's gonna get awfuler so and then he'll get awfulest yep he's gonna become one of the most awfuls ever so when we last left you guys he had just moved to chicago after he was going to try that whole scheme, selling the bodies of the wife and the child of his friend for the insurance, that all that thing. stuff. And then he just abandoned that. And then he's like, oh, that's why there's bones buried in my basement, you idiots. Of Duh. course, I didn't murder anybody except I murdered a lot of people. And now I'm going to brag about it. So figure it out. So figure it out. But yeah, so we left you there. So he's in Chicago now. And as if you know the story of H.H. H. Holmes... You know that it really does revolve around Chicago. Chicago is kind of like the room where it happened. Very much the room where it happened. Devil in the White City, there he is. So once he'd arrived in Chicago, he somehow passed the exam to become a pharmacist. Wow, I would think that that's a pretty difficult exam. Yeah, and he was only one of like a, like a handful yeah. of people. Like it, I guess he had something in there. Maybe chemistry was his thing, and that's... He did a lot of extra stuff with chemistry, so maybe he really did give himself a leg up in that department. Maybe. But maybe he just wasn't great in other things, or he just wasn't a good student, you know? Yeah, exactly. That pretty much makes sense. But he ended up finding work at Holton Drugs, which was a pharmacy on the corner of 63rd and Wallace, and it was owned by an elderly woman named... Mrs. Holton. Ah, imagine Holton that. Holton Drugs. Isn't it funny to think of like stores just being named like something drugs? Yeah, just like, <laughs> like Holton Drugs. Right. <laughs> but she explained to Holmes that the pharmacy actually belonged to her husband, Dr. E.S. Holton. But he was very sick, very, very elderly, you know, ailing oh, at the moment. So H.H. Uh, H. wants to <laughs> kick him right down up. the stairs and take over the, the fucking pharmacy. Yeah, the, the fucking pharmacy kid. kid. And she was finding it a little hard, a little difficult to manage this entire pharmacy by herself. She was elderly herself. So, of course, like we said, his ears perked up. He was sensing opportunity here. And Holmes told her, huh, I, too, am a doctor. I thought you were going to say he said, I, too, am sick and elderly. <laughs> no, he would lie like that, he though. Would. He would just stand there. Like a 27-year-old being, being 27. like, I'm also elderly. <laughs> Why don't you believe me? But My yeah, back hurts. He, he was like, you know what? I'm a doctor. I have a lot of experience in the pharmacy. He did not. Nope. Uh, but he's he did pass the pharmacy exam. So I think he, him cheated. I something happened there. But he was like, you know what? I'm absolutely certain that I can transform this into just a thriving business again if you just give it to me. Doubt it. So not long after he began work at the pharmacy, because she she believed him, of course. Yeah, she's a sweet woman. Dr. Holton did die. Rip. Um, and he left the store and everything in it to Mrs. Holton. So he was fr so Hol Holmes sees this happening and he's like, you know, I he's he's angling to own this store. So he frames it like he's doing her a favor because he's like, You you're old and ailing. You Your husband be. just died. You don't want to run this whole thing. So he's like I'll buy this from you and I'll allow you to live on the second floor. And she was like, 
kind. My God. Sweetie. You are so nice. So she agreed and he did pay her. So she did. She used the money that she got by mortgaging the store's fixtures. Fixtures. Blah, blah. Fixtures. fixtures. Yeah. Why couldn't I say fixtures? It's hard. It's a. I said like fixtures. Because you have to do like a touch. Yeah, that's hard. Fixtures. You know, words are hard. Uh, in the stock. And actually, um, Holmes bought the pharmacy and he rebranded the entire thing as H.H. Holmes Pharmacy. So okay. he took out the drugs. And he replaced it with pharmacy. Well, he there made, you go. He made it more upstanding. You he know? was like, you know what? I think we do a little more here than just drugs. <laughs> you know what? I'm pretty upstanding. So let's change this. Um, in the early days of him owning this new pharmacy, a lot of the customers would come in and they'd ask about Mrs. Holton because people loved her. She was a sweet old lady. Totally. And every time he would say that she went on a trip to California. Oh. Now, this wasn't strange because this is something she had said she wanted to do, but she never had the money to do it. Oh, sweetie. She's not upstairs anymore. And she hadn't returned for several weeks. No. And people are still asking where she is. And when they would ask, Holmes would just be like, well, you know, she just loved California so much that she just stayed there. She's just there. And you oh. can't call her on the phone. Because, like, we don't have those. It's the 1800s here. So, like, you did this, you know, deal with it, I guess. Just she deal she with stayed it. with that. So, there was no actual physical evidence of him having killed Mrs. Hol Holton, but there's no evidence that he didn't either. And there's probably Definitely some cause. circumstantial evidence that points to her probably being killed. Yeah. I think her disappearance was not so much that she moved away or she went on a vacation to California. I think he just got rid of that whole situation so that the entire building could be his. It does sound like that. And it's very on brand with what he would do anyways, so it makes sense. There you go. These are things that he would do later, so it's like, it, why would we not think that it would be this time? I believe she might be his first victim. But what about the boy? I thought you thought the boy was. That one I'm like, I go back and forth with. That one for sure could be his first victim. But the, you like full-heartedly believe Mrs. Holton, that she... I have very little doubt that he killed Mrs. Holton. So she's either his first or his second. Yeah. Uh, but it should be noted, too, that there are variations in this story if you're researching this case yourself, too. Like one of the stories is that the woman, Mrs. Holton, is not super elderly. And that he got ownership of the store in exchange for promising to marry her. Oh, shit. Um, and either her or her daughter, like the story never really makes it clear. Because, again, he confessed to so many different things that some of these stories got intertwined. Sure. But this seems, the one I told seems to be the most correct one. Okay. Um, but the other story is that, like, they both go missing or one of them goes missing. And in another version, the woman's name is Elizabeth Sarah Holton, who is the doctor. And the, the pharmacy is owned by her and her husband, but she's the doctor. They said, let's go with the feminist angle. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that they are a young couple and she decided to sell the pharmacy when she became pregnant. So, like, that's another story. In this version, the couple doesn't disappear and they were actually still living in the neighborhood afterwards. So, like, so it that doesn't, doesn't check. Yeah. Either way, though... He wanted the pharmacy, he got the pharmacy, and then the two the people that previously gone. owned the pharmacy were never seen again. So, like, I think the puzzle piece of Moida is put together, to quote Spencer. I think Spencer. so. <laughs> to quote Spencer, In the Moida department. Uh, yeah, to me, it just, you know, Mrs. Holton was older. People came in looking for her. She wasn't He there. said she went to California. She didn't go to California. Yeah. No matter what, he took ownership of that pharmacy in late 1886. So now the pharmacy is open and it seems to be running pretty smoothly with him at the helm at okay. the very least. Uh, he he's like, everything seems to be going good. So like, you know what? I'm going to look for some romance. I'd like to point out that he is still, still married, married to Clara. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> there's that. So he's turning his attention to the ladies now. When he was in Minneapolis, he met a woman named Miss Myrda Belknap. Murda? I think it's Murda. Um, they've sparked up a flirtation and she seemed pretty smitten with him at the time. And he made his life sound very exciting, which like at the time it kind of was. He yeah. was traveling all over the place. Um, and because at the end of 1886, Myrda's life was small. It was kind of unexciting. She was in the small town, you know, like. Like I'd she, never really seen the world. Yeah, she lived with her parents in Minneapolis and worked in a music store. It was like a cute little existence but like to her that wasn't enough she yeah. didn't feel like she was getting out there i get that so holmes seemed very enticing to her 
and he was very charming. So, and he also represented himself as a very intelligent man. He's a doctor. Like, that's like, whoa, hey. I mean, that's uh, like, you're young and you're getting it. And he's also a business owner in Chicago. Um, so Holmes knew all of this. And so he wrote to Murda and courted her very aggressively. First through letters, and then he did it in person. Like, he was really playing the long game here. And after only a few months of talking back and forth, he took a bold move and he proposed to Murda. And the two ended up being married January 28th, 1887. Oh, okay. Um, he's still married to Clara. I was like, how does... They just, just didn't realize in this district because it was like another district? Oh, I think it was just in the 1800s and they... Like, there's no electronic records happening. There is the 1800s of it. I <laughs> keep forgetting just, that. I'm yeah, like, well, I'm like, why didn't that. they know? <laughs> why didn't they just look it up on the computer? Why didn't they just like uh, write that yeah. down somewhere? So Murdo was very excited about this marriage. But I think that excitement would have been slightly tempered if um, he did let her know that he was still married to a woman named Clara. That'll usually do it. Yeah. Strangely, two weeks after he married Murda, Holmes filed a divorce petition in Cook County Supreme Court against Clara, stating that, quote, on the 28th day of June, 1883, in the city of Ann Arbor, in the state of Michigan, the said Clara A. Mudgett, wholly disregarding and in violation of her marriage vows, covenants, and obligations, committed adultery and had carnal knowledge with one J.M. Downer. What? So he's claiming they should divorce him, Clara and he? Yeah. After he's already married a second woman, by the way. He's now filing for divorce against Clara, saying Clara committed adultery. Like, sir, you are, number one, you did that super <laughs> duper backwards. You're and number up two, committing adultery. You motherfucking hypocrite. <laughs> like, you are in the throes of adulterous behavior. And yeah. you are saying she was, she adultered years ago? It's, what? It's a lot. He's doing, he got married to another woman. Like, are we clear? Melina, that's his right as a man. That's his right. He's a man. So, and he's a doctor. It gets even weirder. In this divorce decree, How he also he had put in there this. He had put in there, he further represents to your honor that he has ever since the time of said marriage conducted himself as a true, kind, and affectionate husband. You dirty little liar. And during that time has faithfully discharged all of his duties. Now, do you remember when he abandoned her several times with their child, lived off her money alone, and beat her to the point of black eyes? Do you I, remember? I do remember recall. Any do, does any of that ring as true, kind, or affectionate? Nor. No. Nor. Oh, well, he also added into the decree that their six-year-old son, Robert, quote, is now living and is under the care, custody, and control of your orator, Herman Webster Mudgett. That simply wasn't true and never was. Wait, so he was saying, like, I take care of the child? Like, he's He literally with me? had put in the divorce decree that that child is now living and is under the care, custody, and control of him. And that's not at all the truth. He had been with Clara the entire time. Also, that's so easy to prove. At one point, he tried to go get Robert and take custody, and she was like, no, bitch. I remember. And, then, and it didn't happen. Right. But he's now having it put in the decree that Robert is in his custody. I don't know if he thought he would get more money or something like that or something would come out of that. that. But like, you're an idiot. And again, so easy to prove. Like you go to his house. Does he have a child's bedroom? Yeah. The, like the end. The end. And he then also, not. you don't want that child. So you're just doing that to be an asshole. Oh, for sure. But how many parents do that? Oh my God. They don't 100%. actually want custody of the child. They just want to do it to hurt yeah. the other parent. What, what? And it's like, fuck you. Yeah. So they looked, and no one could ever find a J.M. Downer either that Clara supposedly had carnal knowledge with. What does by that the even way? mean? They fucked. Oh. Carnal uh, knowledge is fucking. Yeah, that's fucking. That's fucking. Uh, he likely didn't exist. Carnal knowledge. Like, he, he likely did not exist. No. Holmes was a lying sack of shit, but it doesn't really matter anyways because he also failed to show up on any, follow up on any of the administrative requirements. Oh, and the petition, like admin. Yeah. And the petition, like, I hear that. But like, <laughs> and the petition just lapsed and was eventually dismissed by the court for, quote, default of appearance of complainant. It's <gasps> unclear whether Clara ever even received notice of his intention to divorce her. Right. I don't even think she knew he ever wanted to divorce her, so he didn't get divorced. You know what this is giving a little bit? Sheena and Raquel. <laughs> he makes this 
fake TRO, except it's not a TRO. It's and then he doesn't degree. even show up for yeah. the fucking hearing. He doesn't. That's where my head's at. Except he, except he actually, like, should have just divorced Clara. Like, why yeah. are you not getting divorced? Yeah, why I don't are you married understand. to, uh, like, several women at a time? That well, he's the Sandoval in it all now. So, like his, obviously, that's Duh. exactly what you think of with H.H. Holmes. But like his marriage to Clara, Holmes's relationship with Murda started off like that of like any couple in love. She helped him run the pharmacy, and she became very just like impressed and enamored with his work ethic because he was really running this shit. Like she thought, "Wow, what a cute family we are!" Like I'm helping yeah. you run your pharmacy in Chicago, and that's we're so, so successful and. She later said, quote, ambition has been the curse of my husband's life. He wanted to attain a position where he would be honored and respected. He wanted wealth. Mm-hmm. And again, we see the hallmark of his behavior is always based on money. He's got to be, there's got to be Capricorn in his chart. I'm pretty, I yeah. think his birthday, he's a cancer, like a uh, son, but I'm like, there's Capricorn, there's Capricorn in that Capricorn chart. somewhere in there. Money motivated. <laughs> money motivated. <laughs> And to a fault. But in the spring of that year, Murda actually became pregnant. And the bulk of the work she did was shifting, you know, off of her. And her husband had to kind of like take a bigger role back in the pharmacy. See, I want to be excited for her, but I feel like it's going to end bad. No, you definitely don't want to be excited for this whole thing. But um, she was separated from Holmes a lot. Like she was kind of, she had to be in the back now. Right. Like she could do office work. So she was just kind of relegated away from the public too. And, and she was depressing. lonely. Yeah. yeah, she got lonely. So her parents moved from Minneapolis to Wilmette, a small village about 15 miles outside of Chicago. I love that they were like, we'll be with you. Yeah, we'll come and hang with you. And after they had like settled in there, Murda moved in with her parents and gave birth to their daughter, Lucy. Cute. Um, at first, Murda's parents were very suspicious of H.H. H. Holmes. Well, because this all came about very, very quickly. Very quickly. Like married, baby, business. And I feel like parents, <clears throat> they know. It's like he went after young women yeah. at the time and he and he went after young men for like schemes and stuff. So he he was always going for people who he knew he could con. Like young and unexpected. But older people, I feel like it, like elderly people fell for it. But at, somewhere in between, like the parents of the whole generation were like, something is sus about you and I yeah. don't know what it is. And he didn't exactly endear himself to them. Uh, despite his wife and child living in the house, he was barely there. Like, he never Good. came to visit. So they were like, do you want to see your infant child? No. No. Okay. okay. Well, literally never came to see them. That's good. Um, immediately, they began to question the kind of man that their daughter had married and had a child with. And soon, though, he was able to charm his way into their good graces. I'm not sure how, but it took a lot of zhuzhing on his part. It was mainly when they saw the ways that he, like, he wasn't around all the time, but he showered Murda and the baby with gifts mm. and adoration every time he would be there. Okay. So he would love bomb a lot of the time. He was there. When he was there, he was there. He was just never there. And he also... That was beautiful. You know? That was po- Poetry. <laughs> he also always had an excuse for his long absences. It was never just like, oh, whatever, fuck it. Like, deal Working. with it. It was always like, oh, my God, I know. It's just like running a farm, running a business. You know, I'm just such a I'm such a businessman. Business money That motivated. it's like, look at this briefcase. Like, I'm very important. Meanwhile, there's nothing in it. It just opens and it's just like a moth <laughs> flies out. But mm. he would say that things were busy at the store and there was so much to do in Chicago and making it seem, you know, like they... He was just up to his neck in work, and he was just trying to support his little family. And according to Eric Larson, um, who I will um, source his work in our show notes, Holmes's manner of dress and how he would frequently give a lot of gifts and, like, he was always about the material things, that really gave off, and especially back in those days, like, that he was a man of importance. Like, he gave off that air to everybody. Dress for the job you want, not the the, job you have. That's the thing. And he was very concerned with that. Like, he always wanted to present himself as being a man of importance, a man of means, a man of power. And it honestly went a long way to making her parents at least be eased a little bit, thinking, well, he's going to take care of them. Yeah, I get it. So as this is happening... He is now thinking about that infamous murder castle that Aye. everybody knows about. Because now he's in Chicago. He's settled there. He's in an apartment, near, like, above the pharmacy. But he wants more. And he's got grand, grand plans. And during the later decades of the 19th century, Chicago was going, like, there was a huge population boom. A lot of people were moving west 
for work and right. opportunity and like a bigger, brighter life. Kind of like how everybody's like, oh my God, let's go to California and become stars. Mm-hmm. Like it's the same kind of thing. California, New York, Chicago, same vibes. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> As a result, new buildings were popping up all over the city because like people were coming in, the economy was starting to boom, people were trying to make way for a ton of residents to be living there, big apartment buildings. And since arriving in Chicago and starting work, Holmes had been eyeing this empty lot that happened to be across the street from the pharmacy. And finally, in the summer of 1888, he managed to buy it. Aye. And at the time, he uh, registered the deed under the false name H.S. Campbell. This is the beginning of him using many, many aliases to get many, many things. Also, can I just know, wasn't 1888 Jack the Ripper? Uh, yeah. So they were operating at the same time. Mm-hmm. That's so crazy I know, to think that about. Like two of the world's most fucking notorious serial killers operating at the same time. And it's opposite ends of the world. Yeah. It's like so really creepy. wild. Yeah. Crazy. That's why a lot of people think there was some like layover between the two. Really? Like a lot of people think H.H. H. Holmes is Jack the Ripper. And oh, they think okay. Vice versa. Oh. Um, I think we talked about it in the episodes. Yeah. It's a I don't it's have a, a great theory. Memory. It's a theory. <laughs> <laughs> I was like I was like we mentioned it, but <laughs> they, but we they, we didn't go super into it because I don't I one I haven't looked too I haven't looked hard enough into that theory to be convinced by it yet. Yeah. And I don't want to give a full opinion on something that I haven't given the full court press to. Well, and it kind of seems like at least from what I know HH uh Holmes's like operation of murder is very different than Jack the Ripper's, right? It is, and he is mo- <clears throat> he's mainly money vote motivated with his and Jack murders, wasn't, but right. He liked killing as well. Like H. H. Holmes liked killing, and he liked killing women. Yeah, he did enjoy that, and it did. It wasn't to me. H. H. Holmes isn't just a I kill for financial gain. Sometimes it's I killed because I wanted to kill, right? Or I killed because this bitch was in my way. Essentially, yikes! Like not that's essentially what no, he no, would it, say. You know? Yeah. And it's like, that's how he kind of presented himself is like, she was a problem. Yeah. So out she had to go. Damn. And the way he would talk about it was very cold like that. Like, well, she became an issue. So down the chute she went. Crazy. And he was very like intricate about the ways he would do it. To me, it doesn't really line up so far with what I've seen between the two cases because of mainly because of the two, I think, environments with which they were killing in are so vastly different that their methods of murder don't add up together Mm -hmm. but i don't know if that has to do with the environments yeah possibly that that the person tailored himself to those environments right um but who knows i mean when we talked about it in um when we talked actually when we talked about uh it with tobias Mm -hmm. he made a valid point of like which we always thought but like i'm like i don't know in Whitechapel, if it was like somebody like h.h holmes who dressed like a man of importance all the time and was yeah. very like showy, he would stick out like a sh- sore thumb. Mm-hmm. And it's like, so I don't know, but then the reports of Jack the Ripper that he did look a he little fancy. So it's like, but you don't know, you know, like we've come through a lot of different theories with that. And it's like, it could be mistaken. It could be, I don't know. I just hate the unknown. It's an interesting theory and I will look further. I'm, You know what? I'll probably look further into it by the end of this series because cool. I would like to touch upon it more by the end. But I definitely want to look further into it and look at some dates and look at, you know, because I know there was some possibilities that HH was out of the country at certain times and Mm. that maybe Jack had left at certain times. And it would be how fucking crazy would it be if he was Jack the Ripper? It would Because 1888 is when Jack ended, right? 1888, Jack was still going. Oh, he was still going. Okay. All right. Um, but, But he did like, I think this is when he was coming to an end. So, which is interesting because this is really when he, when AJ he really was getting to a started beginning going over, over here. here. So that is interesting. Mm-hmm. It definitely is. I'll be. I'm. I'm excited to hear what you have to say once you are yeah. able to look more into it. I definitely want to look further into it for Sorry sure. For the divergence there, and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, it's really not a divergence though, because it's all the same. Cool. Uh, but <laughs> so we were saying that by the summer of 80, 1888, he had registered this lot across the street from the ph- pharmacy under the false name H.S. Campbell. So this is when Holmes committed the first murder that he would wholly admit to. Okay. He claimed he killed a friend and former schoolmate named Dr. Leacock. Now, he did this because uh, this man had a large life insurance policy, and he said he lured his friend to Chicago under some kind of bullshit pretense, 
gave him, quote, an overwhelming dose of laudanum and killed him that way. After his murder, Holmes took the body of Leacock to Grand Rapids, Michigan. He did this because it would look like Leacock had died accidentally in his home. And then he collected the $40,000 from the life insurance policy. Kind. Now, this is one of the murders people waver about because he loved to talk about murder and mayhem when he was caught. And he really wanted to make everybody like, you gotta know, I'm a fucking monster. Like, he wanted you to know. He was like, let me tell you how bad I am. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need to make us believe he is a fucking monster. That's the thing. Like, he he has no need to exaggerate, and yet he does all the time. It's very strange. But either way, there is mention a lot in his youth, like in his early days, in any research you see, of a classmate at college named Robert Leacock. Now, he was actually the one that Holmes claimed helped him originally come up with the idea of faking a death and using a medical dead body to claim insurance fraudulently. So it would be a little poetic of Holmes to then use that plan on his friend who he came up with it with, but take it to another level and just murder him for it. Like, it would be something he would do. That's a lot. And when he confessed, he said, quote, Like the man-eating tiger of the tropical jungle, I roamed about the world seeking whom I could destroy. Dramatic. That's him. Yeah. That's him. That's him and his mustache. Very Very performative. Uh, Now for the... So this all began. This is what began the murder castle idea, was what he said. Okay. He said after this whole scheme, after he went through with it, he got the money He was ready to go. He said, I had this grand idea for a murder castle. And according to Holmes, the design and the purpose of it really came to him all at once after this. This was like the igniting thing. He had like an epiphany. Yeah. He said he originally envisioned a massive three-floor building, three stories up. The first floor would have retail shops, pharmacies, jewelry shops, clothing stores, In his words, he said it would be, quote, to generate income and allow him to employ as many women as possible. That he could then murder. That he could then murder. Okay. The second and third floors were going to be apartments for rent. And he was going to have his own very fancy apartment in the giant corner unit of the second floor. Like, essentially kind of like a penthouse. Exactly. And he would have a large window that he could gaze over 63rd and Wallace. Like, oh, just like I just got distracted my for a palace. I'm like, I kind of want that. I know. You don't want this Not one, this though. one, no. Now, this was all the normal logistics of a building, it seems. Yeah. Like, that seems like a very normal building. It Ex- seems great. Except all the women. And it seems innocuous to a certain extent. Sure. Pretty normal. Seems like some kind of, he seems like a piggy guy who just wants to like hire women. He's like Doug Dimmadome. There you go. So, well, (laughs) well, this part was important to him. Like that, it was important to him to have a a very front facing business model, a very front facing looking building that no one could question. But what was more important to him was these macabre little details that were going to be hidden inside the bones of the building. They were much more important and much more exciting to him in particular. To us, they're fucking horrifying. To give you an idea, some of the features he wanted was a giant chute that would would extend from one of the apartments on the second floor all the way down to a secret chamber in the basement that would seal off. Then he also wanted a large room in his own personal apartment that you would have to walk into, and then there was a walk-in vault in that that was airtight with iron walls. Oh, why would you want that? Also, how do you talk to the contractors we'll about get to all this. of this? Don't worry about it. He also wanted gas jets throughout the entire building that would be controlled only in his personal office, so he could turn on gas and just gas you anywhere he wanted to. No one's uh, going to notice that in the blueprint. Nope. He also, don't worry, we're going to get to that. He also wanted a large basement with secret storage chambers inside that would seal off. Okay. And like you said, your first thought is, how, how? are you going to get this built, my guy? Right. How are you going to do this? Well, he wanted this all to be very practical from the sense of his murderous intentions, obviously. He needed easy ways of disposing of and hiding dead bodies. He was not willing to bend on any of this. This was his vision. But he also wanted this psychological aspect to it. Like, he knew this was all there, but no one else was going to know this was there. He knew the gas jets would be there, but the guests wouldn't. And he loved the idea of this, like, whole, like, I know, but they don't kind of thing. And it all just fed into his desire to, like, just fuck with people and also kill people. But he knew, like we do, that even though he wasn't willing to bend on any of this, he was making this happen, he knew that um, these 
curious design aspects maybe would draw a little suspicion from any architect, like you said. Perhaps. So without any kind of skill set in design or building, he actually began drawing up plans for the building himself. That's really crazy. Yeah, that's the thing that kills me with him. He's one of those people that you're like, you could have done something great if you had just put your mind to it. Like, you weren't a brilliant guy, but you had a working, you had hard work ethic when you put your fucking mind to it. But not but for you a good cause. But you put it to terrible causes. Exactly. And it's like like this, like you're learning a skill set yourself to, to Which accomplish is something. But you're accomplishing a skill set to build a murder castle because you're scared someone will figure it out. What a wild fucking, like, like this, this is wild real person. too. Like, yeah, this, this is, is a, real. Like, like, what? This is real. And what's, so... There was a population boom in Chicago, like I said at the time. People were moving over there. And it meant that there was going to be no shortage of labor. Like, people were going to be wanting to work on these kind of things. But there was, again, still that problem that these workers were going to ask too many questions. So even though he had put together the blueprints and he was going to have somebody help him, he devised a strategy that would allow him to get the building constructed without any suspicions. The plan was he was going to constantly change the architect's buildings, laborers, none of them were going to be able to get a clear or complete picture of what was being built. They wouldn't be able to ask any questions because they were only going to get bits and pieces of it. I feel like that's like, that's such a gamble to take. His whole life was a fucking gamble. Everything he did was a gamble. I'm just thinking of like work we've had to do on the house and I'm like, wow, I can't imagine being like, okay, you finished that. Now I'm going to call someone else. Yeah, like he just, and what he would do was he would just not pay the person and be like, fuck you, you're you're fired. Bye. Which again, And then just bring someone else in and be like, okay, start working on this. You're creating so many issues for yourself. And they would just be more confused, really. Like they'd just be like, what? And not realize how weird all of this was together. And also due to the lax inspection processes in Chicago at the time and the limited protections for laborers, he was going to be able to get away with not really paying anybody. Like it really wasn't going to be an issue. Like you were saying too, people are so desperate for work that they're probably not asking that many questions. Exactly. When they do get work. That's the other thing. He's banking on that. But it is a really like cunningly smart thing to do to one, start the blueprint process yourself. yourself. To make sure you get all those weird things in there. Right. Then hire architects, have them work a little more on it, then fire them before they're done. Hire another one to build off that other thing. Fire that one. Bring in laborers (laughs) to start building this little extension. Fire them when they're done with it. Hire another one to do that one. Like, that way you're getting it piecemealed together. And nobody can fully get a full picture of what's happening here. Maybe they know a shoot is in there, but they're like, what's that shoot for? And you're like, I don't know, garbage, bye. Like, it's just... No one can really get into the, like, nitty-gritty of what's happening here. It's like you're giving everybody a little piece of the puzzle, but, like... But nothing that they can jump off of. Exactly. The construction of the, quote-unquote, murder castle, which he was calling the Holmes Castle... Yeah. Um, ...began in the summer of 1889. Again, partially working from Holmes's own design blueprints and also working from plans partially developed by local architects, um, two of which were Charles Berger and Edward Gallner. The labor and materials were going to be from Etna, Iron, and Steel. Holmes was ready to begin using this murder castle before it was even started, though. Like, he was like, let's go. Before the foundation had even been completed, he was already making plans to get this thing going. Early in the construction, he actually approached a bricklayer named George Bowman, and he approached him with a very strange proposition. Uh, I'm nervous. He was just a bricklayer. Doing his job. Yeah, I know about H.H. H. Holmes and Bricks. Yeah. Now, Bowman later said, he asked me if I wouldn't like to make money easier than what I was doing. And of course I told him yes. Yeah, who wouldn't? And according to Bowman, he said, a few days later, he came over to me and pointing down into the basement said, you see that man down there? Well, that's my brother-in-law. And he's got no love for me, neither have I for him. Now, it would be the easiest matter for you to drop a stone on that fellow's head while you're working, and I'll give you $50 if you do it. What? $50? Well, at the time. Oh. We're talking about 1888. I I got to keep remembering. Girl, that's a lot. I'm like, $50? (laughs) That's it? It's a lot back then. For the murder of a man? It's honestly unknown what the purpose of this kill proposition was, to be quite honest. He probably just wanted to see that he could do it. He, that's, like, he, he wanted to either make money oh, that's from some avenue by doing this, or he was just honestly asking to see if Bowman was a guy he could trust. I think he was looking for a guy mm. he could trust. But either way, Bowman quit and never returned to the job. Smart man. Yeah. He was like, bye. No, thank you. 
Trust me, though, not everyone working the job site was so kind and willing to run away from this man. In April of 1889, so Holmes met, um, or excuse me, in a, it was in, it's later than April in 1889. I had the wrong month. Holmes met a carpenter by the name of Benjamin Peitzel. I think it's Peitzel. I think you're um, right. At first, Peitzel's job was to take care of the horses that were going to be used on the construction site. Because again, we're in the 1800s. Uh, but oh my over God, time, we are? We are. But over time, <laughs> he actually gained Holmes's trust a lot. Dun, dun, dun. And he became like an assistant to Holmes, like sure. a personal assistant. Peitzel was a little like Holmes. He had a history of petty crimes, misdemeanors. It's kind of a ne'er-do-well. And eventually <laughs> it all caught up to him and he was arrested for passing bad checks in Indiana while he was out wor- while he was still working for Holmes. That was stand like, up man. So Holmes actually bailed Peitzel out of jail. Yeah, that's his right hand. He paid the amount in bad checks, by the way. He bailed him out with bad checks. Bailed the man sitting in yep. jail for bad checks out of jail with yep. bad checks. The Holmes irony. is nothing but a poet. Uh, Peitzel failed to return to Indiana for the trial, so... Now they were just like, now they nothing could happen. They're like, we're out. They're so like now, Jay-Z and Beyonce on the run together. They're thick as thieves together because now they're the boss and the assistant. It's like the assistant to the regional manager from the office. There you go. Now, after a year or two, the unpaid bills and the schemes and the lying and the fraud, it started to catch up with Holmes. That'll happen. Unfortunately, for the most part, though, individual laborers, many of them were immigrants. They had no way of getting the money owed to them. That's so fucked. Yeah. And that sucks. He just got away with that. Mm -hmm. But remember, he's using Aetna Iron and Steel for the supplies. That's a major company who doesn't give a shit about your feelings. So they sued his ass. And when he didn't pay his debts, they were like, we're fucking taking all this back, dude. But when they sued him in the fall of uh, in the fall of 1889, he tried to use like usual bullshit tactics and excuses that he did to get out of paying them. One thing he did was he changed the deed on the property to make it look like it was owned by his mother-in-law. Yeah. What? So he said he wasn't responsible for the debt because it was in her name. How do you just do that? He just did that. Like, what? For the most part? Like, so literally, he had first registered that deed under a false alias. Right, but that's And then when work. he started getting in trouble... He just shifted it all into his mother-in-law's name and was like, these are her debts. I don't know what you're talking about. I love that. And like, nobody was like, yeah, dude, like, clearly you just did that. Yeah, that's the thing. Back then you could do that easily. You can shift out like, who's going to catch you? You know, you just like write her name in there and you're like, there it is. You just like spit on on the previous writing, rub it off. Exactly. So for the most part, all his like legal shit was handled by his lawyer, Edward Marr who actually did manage to successfully like push off creditors for a while, but he was, and he was honestly his lawyer till he was like executed essentially. Damn. Um, And he did manage to help him out in this scenario. I think they just like kind of backed off a little bit because it was under her name. Mm -hmm. That was going to be an issue, but you wouldn't think this murder castle would be like, you would think that this would be a very long process of building this thing. It's huge. And with all the complicated, It's an annoying long project. There's all the constant turnover of workers and architects. There's legal troubles now associated with it. But the actual construction of the building happened really quickly. Really? It was literally like pretty much done by the end of 1889. Wow. So like a year. Or or, excuse me, it was done by um, 1890. Okay, so like um, two-ish years. Yeah, but that's and I crazy. think they were putting like finishing touches on it until 91, but it was essentially like livable at that point. Um, Holmes had already moved Murda, Lucy, and her mother, the one he had thrown the deeds into, into the large corner apartment on the second floor. I think that's how he was able to get away with doing these kind of things was he would then, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm I'm handling it. Here's your beautiful penthouse. Yeah, like, like here you go. It's like a Jada Essence Hall. Look over there. Exactly. So, yeah, they all got to live on there. And a short time later, he sold the drugstore across the street, the original one that he got from Mrs. Holton. Um, And the new owner who bought it, he was like, oh, like, you're going to love it here. You have no competition. There's no other drugstore. Like, you're the only pharmacy. Like, I'm telling you, this place is going to be booming. It's great. Like, don't worry about it. And he was like, oh, great business. See you later. Bye. He turns around and opens a new drugstore on the first floor of the murder castle. What an actual douchebag. Yeah. 
But that's a perfect example of why you don't just have a an agreement by word of mouth. He's such a dick. Yeah. Like, he's just such a dick. Yeah. He does things just to be a dick. Well, like, he, he's he, such a fuck He gets boy. kicks around. He like, really he, is. He loves it. Now, among the first few, because again, you don't know which one is his first murder victim. That's so crazy. But among the first, among them, um, in Chicago was John Dubry. And it was actually one of his investors in the murder castle. Uh, it was a man that Holmes owed money to. Mm. Dubry have, had actually arrived in Chicago to see the, ab- the complete, completed construction of the castle and to get his money that he owed. Uh, this was on April 18th, 1891. Because like I said, in 91, it was like Dunsky. Sure. And he hadn't even entered the building when he actually dropped to the ground outside the pharmacy and began convulsing. Oh. According to Benjamin Nixon, who was like, uh, I think he was in the jewelry store on the first floor. He might have even um, owned it, I think. He saw Holmes rush outside to Debray's side and, quote, poured a dark liquid down Debray's throat, and he died immediately. What? On the street. I wonder, so did, would Holmes have anything to do with his convulsions beforehand or no? No idea. Or if it was just a happy accident, accident that he was able wow. to pour something down his throat that would kill him instantly. Holy shit. I don't know. But Debray's death may not, it, like, he didn't get any money from it, but he didn't lose any money either. Well, yeah, because he's going to have to pay thing. him. Yeah, it so got him out of So he kind of play. did get money out of it. And he would have had to pay a small fortune to him. I mean, he was an, he investor, was an investor in the thing. That was a lot. He was essentially a loan on the castle, but right. he didn't have to pay anymore. Right, so he and did like, get money out yeah. of it. Now, during the construction of the castle and into its first year, he was engaged in a lot of schemes, like little schemes, you know, like the the snake oil salesman kind of schemes. Mm-hmm. Like he would sell mineral water to people and say it would like cure all the shit, but it was just vanilla infused tap water. Sounds kind of good. <laughs> um, he would con widows out of their pensions. You know, he was very into that. He's such a like, yeah. like low down fucking asshole. He is, he is a low down just dirt bag. Yeah. He really is. I mean, he's capable of murder, so obviously, he's but like so low down then in the, every way though. The little like just like petty crimes and el- on top like of widows that. out of pensions. Yeah. Like, God damn. I just want an elderly woman to beat him over the head with her yeah. purse. But he was still very committed, but while doing these schemes, he was committed to his murder for profit idea. That mm-hmm. was his main thing. Right. And in 1891, shortly after everything was done, Holmes approached a woman who did his laundry. And he had a he had a proposition for. Her. Oh God. And she was the laundress um for like the actual castle. Um, and he, I know he would pay the one, he said, I'll pay you $6,000. That's a lot. Uh, Back then. I'll pay you $6,000 to take out a life insurance policy in the amount of $10,000. Which is even more. And she was like, why the fuck would you pay me to do that? Like, I don't understand. Why would I do that? And he said, well, then after you die, I would make $4,000 profit on the investment. And in the meantime, you can spend the $6,000 however you want. You just get $6,000 free and clear. And this woman was really young. And her job as a laundress really didn't make her any money. So she was going to absolutely agree to this. She was like, of course I want $6,000 right now. Nothing is ever that good. Like he had her. But then he apparently leaned in close to her and softly said, don't be afraid of me. And if that was Thomas Shelby, sign me up. Like, I will buy that life insurance does policy. He, does he say that to people? Like, no, but I just thought that's something that Thomas Shelby would absolutely do. Like, oh, he okay. has that vibe. Okay. Like, I'm not afraid. But this is Herman Webster Mudgett. Who smells like scrotum. Exactly. So she immediately <laughs> said something about him. Just, I, that was off. It scared me. And she was yeah. like, I immediately declined the offer. Anybody that says, don't be afraid of me, for out of the blue, no reason, I'm afraid of. And I think he was trying to do the, like, don't be afraid of me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, aren't I charming? Like, you know and what I mean? like being so but on like, the nose that, like. But you're like, you actually are scary. That's like, that's like, what I meant when I said, like, if, Ta- if Killian Murphy oh, is leaning bitch. into you and saying, don't be afraid of me, I'm like, I'm not. You know and what, like, though? I would still be afraid. <laughs> I would not. The sexy, Harry motherfucking <laughs> Styles could walk up to me and say, don't be afraid of me. And I'd be like, you know what, Harold? It's been a good run. 
<laughs> it's been a good fucking run. But Herman Webster Mudgett says that to me, and I'm like, bye. I would run so far away. Bye. So also, that this lady was like, absolutely not. He, just like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, he's trying some shit. So it's like when people say like, I don't bite. I'm like, yeah, I figured because we're all humans here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in 1890, like the year before. Yep. After a long bidding and, like, crazy process, it was announced that the next World's Columbian Exposition would be held in Chicago, and it was going to be held between May and October of 1893. So this timing was supposed to coincide with the celebration of Christopher Columbus's arrival in North America. Holy shit. Uh, the World's Exposition was a huge fair with all the fair accoutrements, um, and it was held in and around Jackson Park. It was going to be celebrating the scientific and technological advancements of mo- of the modern world. It's it was so like funny to think about. Very mustache twisty and bowler hat wary and old sport kind of vibes, you know? Like yeah. everyone's got a cane. Loves it. Yeah, it just feels right. Parasols in the air. Yeah. Like the, you just don't the, care. Exactly. The fair was <laughs> going to be a massive spectacle. It was going to very much draw in hundreds of thousands of visitors to chicago visitors you it was going to be a huge huge boom for the local econ- economy it was a, a huge win for them to get it here and a so, huge win for mr H. H. for chicago <laughs> and holmes he was probably pretty psyched about tourist dollars coming in like regular ones like you know there was going to be a lot of boom in the economy that's been good for everybody mm-hmm. but he was not one to waste opportunities that were just going to stroll into his life especially if it involved bringing unsuspecting women into his orbit. Exactly. So he was like, well, this is even better. Like, this works for me. So so that's when Ned and Julia Connor arrived in Chicago. No. They were in need of work, a place to stay, and somebody they knew was like, you should check with this guy, H.H. H. Holmes. He's got a new building. I'm sure there's employment opportunities in it. There's also places to live. Like, he's a perfect guy to go to. And apparently... They were right because he had a jewelry store on the first floor and he happened to need somebody to work there. It was crazy. Oh, wow. So Ned was hired like on the spot to work in that jewelry store. What a and great they ended win. up moving into an apartment in the Holmes Castle. Mm. Better still, Holmes was like, oh, Julia can work in the pharmacy with me. Oh, God. And I can train her to keep the books. Like you guys just got two jobs in one. That's wild. And then Julia's sister, Gertrude, moved into the city a few months later, and he was like, I'll employ her as well. Wow, what a great guy. Such a nice guy. Oh, and that's so sad, too, that they probably were like, wow, like, how lucky are we? Yeah, and like, what a kind guy. Like, he's just like, ready to help people who come into the city. Now, to Ned, things felt like, wow, we've been really struggling, and this is finally falling all into place. But he said that, but there was always something about H.H. H. Holmes that he said made him uncomfortable. Was it he the just smell? didn't like it. It was probably the smegma. Uh, <sighs> he seemed overly interested and attentive to Julia and Gertrude. Yeah. Uh, grossed him out, made him feel weird. Um, I had that feeling. <laughs> he continued to feel some type of way about Holmes as they started to become better acquainted. Mm-hmm. And he said he kept noticing stranger and stranger behavior. He was just an odd guy. And he said on one occasion... Holmes was like, I got something to show you, Ned. And he was like, okay. And he showed him that large vault that he'd installed in his uh, his apartment. Mm-hmm. And he showed him another one in the basement. And he showed him one in the basement and said, Ned, step inside. No. And Ned stepped inside and he closed the door. And before he closed the door, he said, I just want to show you how well this is soundproofed. Oh, my God. And so he shut the door and he said, I shut the door and put my ear to the crack, but could only hear a faint sound. And he was immediately worried and put off by the fact that Holmes had made a point of showing him this weird secret vault and then demonstrating to him how it locks and how, by the way, Ned, no one will hear you in here. That's he let him out of it. So terrifying. But this was definitely a just so you know, this is like, where I can put you. We're moving out yeah. in two and a half minutes. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Now, over time during this whole thing, because remember... Holmes is paying a lot of attention to Julia. Like, it's getting weird. Mm -hmm. So things between Ned and Julia are becoming strained. Right. Because she's kind of fallen for it. Julia B. Again, H.H. Holmes is very charming. He's got it all. He's, he's, these women are being told the world. They are seeing the world. They are seeing him as this very important guy, this very wealthy and connected guy. And at the same time, they're making money. Exactly. Exactly. Now, they're arguing a lot, Ned and Julia, and, you know, 
he was really having trouble with how much attention was being paid to her and how she was seeming to like it. And he later told reporters, I finally told her we could not go on that way. I told her that at a, I told her on a certain day we would quit, that she could go her way and I would go mine. And when that day came, I did not go upstairs to our room, but stayed downstairs and slept in the barbershop. Oh, that's so sad. So in the months that followed this, Ned tried to get his relationship back on track. He was like, we were fine before. Like, right. This is ruining everything. Like, this guy literally came in and just like yeah. took complete control over And you. Gertrude, her sister, left the city a while later. So like she wasn't around anymore. So, so now Julia. it was just Julia. And he was trying to fix it. But during this time, home suddenly offered out of nowhere to sell ned the pharmacy what the on the first floor he and does like, ned even have like pharmacy experience well and he was like i want you to own the store like not be a pharmacist but i want you to own the business and of course ned is like hell, hell yeah. yeah are you kidding me and he's like this is going to be the thing that's going to improve me and julia's relationship i'm going to be a business owner like oh. i'm going to take her attention but unfortunately the business made things worse because Holmes had sold it to him knowing he hadn't paid a fucking dime to any of his creditors. And now those debts, sorry, Ned, those are your debts you now. You inherited all of them. So those. now not only is he struggling to keep this thing afloat, but he's now having creditors coming after him for money. Oh, shit, that he dude. didn't That he didn't do. No. Now, the issues between Ned and Julia were made way worse by the fact that Julia had actually given birth to a daughter named Pearl. Pearl! Um, so any divorce would include... A pretty unpleasant custody agreement between the two of them. So it was getting the discord is just getting worse and Very worse. Very contentious. But things were not improving between them. The pharmacy was being a huge money pit and a big struggle on both of their lives. So Ned told Holmes, I took a job with a jewelry company in downtown Chicago. I don't want the pharmacy. I want out. Mm hmm. And a short time after he'd left the castle, Ned made one final attempt to try things, to make things work with Julia. But by then, she was engaged in a full affair with Holmes. Very <gasps> oh. uninterested in Ned. Julia refused to get back together, and Ned packed up his things and moved to uh, Gilman, Illinois. And he filed for divorce, and he signaled his intent to gain custody of Pearl. I hope he did. Keep hoping that. So by oh, the fall, girl, why you say that yeah. to me? So by the fall, Holmes had moved Myrta and Lucy. Yeah, his wife and child. Mm -hmm. You remember? Yeah, they yep. were they living. Sorry, were they in his apartment or were uh -huh. they in the? Oh, they were in his. They're in okay. his apartment. Okay. Uh, remember, he's also married to Clara still. Yep, and Myrta, and he's also having an affair with Julia. Yeah. So how does he even keep all their um, names straight? Yep. So uh, well, don't worry. He moved Myrta and Lucy, his wife and child, um, into a house several miles away. Okay. In downtown Chicago, and he was just spending most of his time at the castle, where Murda didn't know it, but he was having a full-blown affair with Julia Connor. So this affair was super intense, like very passionate, very intense. And Holmes kept telling her, I'm going to marry you. I'm going to marry you. And it's like, my guy, you're married to two other women. You're not even supposed to be married to the woman you're married to. And at this Julia point. knows that he's married. Yeah. And it's like, if he's telling you he's going to marry you, do you really think that means mm -hmm. that much to him? No. So he's constantly promising he's going to marry her. But once Ned left Chicago, suddenly it all... Foo, 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 foo. Yeah, because it's not as exciting. Yeah, all of a sudden he'd lost interest. Not, the risk of getting caught was gone. There was really no... There was wasn't no competition. forbidden fruit anymore. Right. And he's uninterested by That's it. That's so fucked. So by November of, 19, of 1891, Julia told Holmes that she was pregnant. Again? Yeah. Oh. Remember, Pearl is Ned's child. Yes, yes. No, I know. But she's pregnant again. Oh, no. Uh, so said, now you have to marry me. He doesn't think so. Uh, Holmes was like, okay. And then he was like, yeah, I guess I do have to marry you. So he was like, yep, I'll marry you, but on one condition. And she was like, what is that? And he said, you're going to get an abortion. <gasps> oh, my God. And he said, and I'm going to perform it. Oh, God. Oh, so no. Julia reluctantly agreed. And several weeks later, she was on an operating table that he had put together in one of the empty apartments on the second floor of the house of the castle. That's dirty. She's on the table. He poured chloroform onto a rag and held it to her mouth and nose to sedate her. Uh, but he should have only had to do that for like a second. Instead, he just held it on there, held it into place and continuously dripped more and more chloroform onto the rag while it was on her face. She struggled to get off and tried to fight him off, 
but after several minutes of this horrific torture, he felt for a pulse and she was gone, as well as the unborn child. Wow. Wild that he could do that to a woman carrying his child, yeah. too. Like, it gets worse. Oh. He then walked into Pearl's bedroom. <gasps> oh, no. And I did the exact Pearl. same thing to Pearl. Oh. A child who was likely about five or six. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hate him so much. Or maybe not even. She might have been like four. Oh, my God. Now, once everybody was dead, Holmes contacted a man named Charles Chapel, who Holmes uh, knew was a trained articulator. What is that? A person trained in stripping the flesh from human bodies in preparation for medical instruction. Wish He's, I never asked. Yeah. Uh, he'd make him into an articulated skeleton, essentially. Great. Charles Chapel asked absolutely no questions when he was led to an empty apartment in the castle where a dead body was. He knew Holmes was a doctor, and he just kind of accepted the claim that he had been doing some kind of dissection, and he wanted this body cleaned. Oy, oy, oy. So he offered him $36 to clean the body, make a fully articulated skeleton and skull, and he was like, sure. So Chapel returned the body afterwards, and he, Holmes sold her skeleton to the uh, Hainman Medical College in Chicago. No one knows what happened to Pearl, uh, but when investigators excavated the basement of the castle, they did find the bones of a child between the, what they think is the ages of four to ten years old. Oh, So it could have been her. Sweet Pearl. Now, in the days after this, Julia's neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. John Crow, who, worked, who lived in the, in the uh, castle, Asked about her and Pearl. Mm -hmm. like, where did she go? Like, where did they suddenly disappear? And no one else in the building had seen them for days. And finally, they caught up with Holmes and they were like, what happened? And he was like, oh, Julia and Pearl left early for a planned trip to Davenport, Iowa. Um, obviously. Like, you didn't she tell you? And they were like, mm, I don't know about that. But they were like, okay, I guess we have to just accept this explanation. Right. And it was only after his arrest that they learned that Julia had never gone to Davenport. Oh. They didn't learn until after he was arrested. And then imagine, like, obviously they have no reason to. Yeah, what the are they going to think? You would you feel? murder her? Like, right. That's... So in January 1892, a new family moved into the Connors' old apartment, the Julia and Ned Connors' apartment and Pearl. Um, and when they arrived in to move in... They found it completely the way it was. The dishes were still out on the table. Pearl's clothes were laid out on a chair. Oh, my God. It was like they had just walked out one afternoon and never returned, which is that's what exactly happened. Because what happened, right. Holmes explained to them that Julia, the person who had lived here before, her sister had become ill a few weeks earlier, and she and Pearl had had to leave right away to tend to her. And according to Holmes, there was no need to pack up their belongings as Julia and Pearl were well provided for and would not be coming back. I'd be like, yeah, that's great. But like, you're the landlord. You should you're have this place to clean cleaned out, asshole. Up. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Like, I have to just like take all this shit yeah. out of here now and move mine in. Yep. Now, he gave a different version of this story to others when they asked, because of course he's giving three different things about what happened to Julia and Pearl. It's also like, maybe you should stick with the same story, brother. Yeah. I mean, um, glad you didn't, but... Yeah, when others asked, he claimed that Julia had briefly come back in early January to settle up rent she'd owed him, and at that time, quote, announced not only to me, but to her neighbors and friends that she was going away. Yeah, she didn't say that to anybody, though. But apparently, he knew ahead of time that Julia had mentioned to others that she had plans to visit her sister in Iowa at some point, oh. so the story would seem legit. He had planned this all out. Fuck. He also vehemently denied any claims or rumors that he had any kind of inappropriate sexual relationship with Julia. They were just friends. Totally. What are you talking about? Yeah, for sure. Even though, like, it was very clear, like, very, very clear, like, Ned knew, everybody knew. But he later said, quote, that she is a woman of quick temper and perhaps not always a good disposition may be true. But that any of her friends and relatives will believe her to be an amoral woman or one who would be a party to a criminal act, I do not think. Okay, Jen. <laughs> um, so that happened. Mm. In the spring of 1892, Benjamin Peitzel, his assistant there. Not this fuck. He traveled to Dwight, Illinois, which is a small village about 25 miles from Chicago. I found this interesting because immediately, for some reason, I thought of him, like I made the little quip about him being like assistant to the regional manager. Yeah, and then, and then Dwight. he traveled to Dwight, Illinois. That is funny. funny. Um, but he went there because he was um, getting treatment for alcoholism. 
Be, uh, ben was. Uh, Benjamin, yeah. Okay. He was doing that at the Keeley Institute. And while he was there receiving treatment, he met a young woman named Emmeline Sagrand. And at that time, she was working as a stenographer for the Institute. What's a stenographer again? Uh, the, like, typer right. person. Right, okay. thank you. Um, takes uh, transcripts. Yep, yep, yep. And Peitzel was just taken by her beauty. Oh. Like, he saw her oh, wait, just no. like, oh, my God. That? So when he returned home from sh- to Chicago after the treatment, he told Holmes all about this magnificent, beautiful young woman. Girl, shut your mouth. Oh, he did this on purpose. He knew that Holmes would be seriously interested in this. He was doing his job as his assistant. I found you a pretty young thing. But he's oh I I'm, here I am thinking that like he's in love with this oh chica. no he said she's just she's beautiful. just beautiful you should kill her hey she's this beautiful young woman you would probably like her oh my god so he knew that he would be very interested in this and he was right he loved the idea of a beautiful woman almost as much as he loved the idea of killing a beautiful woman so Holmes wrote to Emmeline and based only on Pitesell's description he wrote to her. Like, wow. Heard Pitesell's description. And he was like, got to write to this girl. Very King Henry VIII. Very much. And he offered her a job at twice the salary she was making now as a stenographer at the Keeley Institute. Shit. So, of course, she was like, uh, yeah, like twice the salary. Are you Anybody kidding me? Anybody would sign up for that. So she arrives in Chicago. She finds a room at a boarding house and she begins work as Holmes' assistant with the ABC Copying Company which is one of his sham businesses that was operating on the first floor. He had a shit ton of those. The always he had like be a, closing company. Yeah, right. And he had, a, he had like a glass bending business down there that was a sham too. But the landlady of the boarding house she was staying at called um, Sagrand a very pretty girl and was a favorite among the boarders. Though she se- seldom went out with any of the young men. Hmm. So she's known very much so as a beautiful woman. But apparently she immediately liked Holmes. He was all over her, praising her constantly, spoiling her with attention and gifts. And the landlady later said she was greatly infatuated with Holmes and never ceased talking about him. I did not like him. He could not look one in the face. Hmm, To me, this signals a little bit of a difference to the he didn't look you in the eyes thing. He wouldn't even look you in the face. Yeah. Like this guy, there is a little, there's something there. There is. Like that's different than the strabidmus kind of situation where he can't like focus on your eyes. Exactly. He wasn't even looking you in the face. It's also like all these women are taken with him. The women that are taken with him work beneath him. Exactly. So it's that whole like, oh, like man in power kind of thing. But the women who are like, I don't know. I always thought he was going to murder someone. Yeah. We're just like doing their own thing and had his number. Right. And it wasn't long until he shammed his way into a romantic relationship with poor Emmeline. Now, other employees noticed, like at the castle and the different businesses, they noticed and everyone around them knew something was going on. One of Holmes's castle tenants, Dr. Maurice Lawrence, told the Inter-Ocean, we felt that she was, be, she was to be more pitied than blamed. He was apparently very kind to her, always buying flowers and presents for her and taking her to the theater and places of entertainment. They always, they nearly always ate their meals together in his office, having them sent up from the restaurant on the first floor. So they're living this like beautiful life of eating like lunches together and Oof. buying her things, taking her out, very much like just showering her. It would be I'd so like to great remind if it was you, real. he is married to Clara. He is also married to Murda. He has a child, Lucy. He was carrying on an affair with a woman named Julia who had a child named Pearl who was also pregnant with his child. He murdered Julia and that child and Pearl. And, and is still married to Murda and Clara. And Clara has a son with him, George. Robert. Robert, why did I say George? <laughs> I was like, Robert. You were like, actually, it's Robert, it is Robert but, but, but try. Yeah, absolutely. No, th- which is just like, what the fuck? <laughs> so at this point, he would have had three children? At this point, he would have had three children. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, or no, he would have had two children because Pearl was not his. But she was pregnant, Julia. Yeah, but he had just says Robert. And Lucy. Oh, and Lucy. Yeah. Yes, you're right. You're correct. Yeah. Um, so he's Robert Lucy and he would have had Julia's child. So yeah, he would have had and he would have children. had a step child yep, technically. Absolutely. What a fucking asshole. Actual piece of shit. Uh, and Murda's just uh, across town. Yeah, like a few miles yeah. away. And he's carrying on this like very public affair. And she has no idea? And I, according to the everything, she doesn't know. Okay. And if she did, she was like, fuck you. Now, in the winter... Of 1892, Emmeline told several people she would be returning to Lafayette, Indiana, to visit her parents for a few weeks before Christmas. Now, according to her cousin, Dr. B.J. Sigrand, who'd visited with her very shortly before she was scheduled to leave, 
He said Miss Sh- Miss Sagrand was changing her feelings towards Holmes. Sounds like something happened that turned her off. Mm-hmm. Don't know what. Maybe he leaned in and said, "Don't be afraid of Don't me." Don't be afraid of me. Because then several days passed, and no one in Inglewood had seen or heard from Emmeline Sagrand. No. When the wife of Doctor Maurice Lawrence, the tenant in the castle, who had that other quote, asked at, like about her to Holmes, he simply said, "Quote." Oh, she's gone away to get married. Oh, what? This obviously was a little weird because uh, she'd never dated anyone but him. It was pretty clear that they were in a relationship and Emmeline never mentioned leaving early and no one ever heard of Emmeline being engaged to someone else. Also, she said that she was very put off about how he spoke about it. He was very anxious appearing. Uh, he couldn't look at her when he said it. Mm-hmm. He was very monotone. He didn't want to talk too much about it. And now this is the second woman who's just up yeah. and left him uh, out of suspiciously. Nowhere. Yeah. And it's to her, it felt like he was hiding something and scared it was going to come out if he t- said too much. Yeah. Like he was really hiding something here. And so the next day, she notices that she sees Holmes and two of his assistants carrying a heavy trunk out of the castle and loading it onto a wagon. Normal. One day after that, Holmes left Chicago for the house in Wilmot where Murda and Lucy lived, and Murda's parents. Because remember, he's married with a child two times over. I just mm-hmm. want to keep reminding you of that. He went to his wife's house. When he returned a few days later, he made a point of showing Mrs. Lawrence in particular, who had asked about yep. uh, Emmeline. He showed her an envelope that he'd got containing cards announcing Emmeline's supposed wedding to Robert Phelps. On December 7th, 1892. As if she would send him a wedding invitation or announcement. Well, a few weeks later, Emmeline's trunk arrived at her parents' house in Indiana. It had all her clothes, all her belongings that she had taken with her when she left for that job. And according to um, Eric Larson's book, her parents hoped that she'd sent the trunk, trunk because... She must now be marrying a wealthy man, and she doesn't need all this old stuff. So she's she sending write it back to and us. Say that? But her cousin BJ pointed out that Emmeline was in the habit of writing her parents two or three times a week. Right. If that was the case, she definitely would have written, and she had not written. So you think um, the big trunk was all her things that they moved out? Oh no, I think she was in that big trunk, and they disposed of yeah. her along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think she. So whatever the case, the trunk arrived. That was the last time that her family got anything from her. Now, according to Holmes's confession later, Emmeline, quote, had become almost indispensable in my office work. And the idea of losing her to an unknown fiance and Dwight was unacceptable. Oh, so he stuck with that? So he said, I endeavored upon several occasions to take the life of the young man. And failing in this, I finally resolved that I would kill her instead. Um, I don't think so. So he claimed he lured Emmeline into the large vault in his office and closed the door, causing her, quote, to suffer the tortures of a slow and lingering death. Jesus Christ. What is worse about this is it's very likely true. Yeah, I believe it. Because he tested it out with uh, Ned. The name Phelps, which is supposedly her fiancé's name, was a known alias of Benjamin Peitzel, which he was using around the time he would have met Emmeline at the Keeley Institute. Oh, shit. So, so Phelps it never existed. And then people would have been like, oh, yeah, like she mm-hmm. did talk to a guy named Phelps. Now, too, on January 2nd, after she disappeared the fall in uh, 93, Holmes asked Charles Chappelle for help. Now, do you remember Charles Chappelle is the articulator? Uh-huh. And he said Holmes sent him a trunk containing a young woman's body to be stripped of flesh and articulated. (sighs) Now, a few weeks later, the LaSalle Medical College of Chicago received a delivery of a nicely articulated skeleton. Oh, no. When police searched the castle after he was arrested, inside that large vault that that he said he put her in, they found a woman's footprint in the enamel on the wall, and it was made with so much force that it was unable to be wiped off. Oh, my God. She was trying to escape and, like, kick her way out of there. That so is it 100% so, was true. So brutal. And he was selling their articulated skeletons to medical colleges. Those medical colleges must have been haunted as fuck. Like, what the fuck? And that is where we are going to end for part two. I didn't see that coming, you arsehole. Because we're going to get some more. Trust that we have a lot more coming, and it's a lot. Oy. So 
We're going to, and I want to look into the, the Jack the Ripper thing a little more for part three. I want to like to see if I can get into that a little more. Yeah. So, uh, hang tight. Okay. But he's, he's just gotten started oh, and he's okay. already this bad. So awesome. Yep. Alrighty. So that is part two of H.H. H. Holmes. We have the murder castle being built. We have it being in full operation so far. We haven't seen the, um, the little macabre element, all the macabre elements being used. We've seen that vault being used quite a bit. Yeah, we have we have seen that a lot. Yeah, but I'm scared. There's yeah, there's a lot that's about to happen, and I'd like you guys to hang tight. And I'm scared about the bricks of it all. Yeah, just just hold on to your butts, you know. Okie dokie, Smokey. Well, we love you, and we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. You already know the drill. <laughs> you don't don't do don't this. Don't ever keep it that weird. Don't move to Chicago or anywhere for that matter, and build a murder castle. It, uh, don't do it. Build a haunted castle. <laughs>